Good morning, all. Welcome to the MSF Scientific Day. Sorry for the abrupt start, but I just wanted to remind you that actually this is not about a day where there's a few people in one centre in Europe talking about a few studies with a little bit of results, but this is a chance for MSF and a wider global community to talk about where we've done well and where we've fallen far short of where we should do in our, progra in our programs. This is a day where we get to look at evidence that we've gathered within our programs and debate what it means for improving the work that we do and how we can bring more attention to the people and populations who have such great needs that continue to not be met, both medically and politically. We are going to be keeping quite strictly to time, but there will be a lot of opportunity for debate. That debate will happen both in the auditorium, but also with questions coming in from the online audience. We, we already had a, a, a photo sent in from uh, Monash in uh, Melbourne, Australia, where actually a group of people is sitting watching the event, but they've gone to the effort of printing out all of the posters so that they can have their own uh, unique uh, experience of this day. But it's not just there. We've had uh, tweets coming in from the team in Pakistan. We also have this year not just one day, but it's four days around innovation and research. So tomorrow's day you'll hear more about is the, the innovation day. Today is focused more on uh, MSF scientific research. But there's also our regional events happening in the next couple of weeks in uh, southern African region and also in, in India. Um, because what we're looking for is a conference without borders where the results get debated and have an impact uh, where they are most needed. Um, I have a couple of housekeeping points. So firstly, if there happens to be a fire alarm, I, I have to mention this. Um, our, for those in the auditorium, it, it means heading out, uh, turning left and turning left as you come out here and gathering at Cavendish Square. Um, and we'll then be able to uh, work out whether it's a, a real alert or, or what we need to do from there. For those on the online audience, that's a chance perhaps to gather a coffee and follow the Twitter stream to see what's going on. Hopefully that won't happen. Um, the toilets for those in the auditorium are in the central atrium down the stairs. Can I ask you during the day, please, to come back slightly early in the breaks. You'll have plenty of time for breaks and discussion, but it's important that you come back uh, on time so that we can stay on time. Last year, we managed to have people watching from 115 countries. Uh, there was at least 5,200 uh, unique uh, logins um, to watch this event. But that in and of itself, those numbers don't mean anything if the research we do doesn't lead to impact and change and improvement. And that's where I want us to be debating uh, what we do today. For the first time this year, we're, we're trying live uh, French translation. So um, for those who prefer to follow online uh, in French, that will be available as well. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to uh, Vicky Hawkins, who's the uh, Executive Director for Médecins Sans Frontières in the UK office. Thank you, Vicky. Thanks, Phil, and good morning, everybody. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to welcome you back here to the Royal Society of Medicine for the 2016 Scientific Day, both to those in the auditorium and to our big online audience that Phil has already referred to. We've got a very stimulating agenda ahead, and the format of the Scientific Day continues to develop in a really exciting way with forthcoming events in Delhi and Johannesburg over the next couple of weeks. I'm very pleased today that on the agenda we've also got colleagues from the IRC and from ALIMA, and a big welcome to them and to those colleagues that are joining us from the academic community. Together, we'll all be talking to you about our work and our research in Haiti, in Niger, in Nigeria, and in Europe, to name just a few of the countries that will be referenced. We'll be learning the lessons and applying those lessons to our ongoing medical work. But before we start today, I'd like to focus your minds on a different list of countries. 
Syria, Yemen, Afghanistan, Ukraine, and South Sudan. These are all countries that in the last 15 months, MSF run and MSF supported medical facilities have been either bombed or attacked. Over 80 staff, patients and caretakers have lost their lives in these attacks and there have been many more wounded. And hundreds of thousands have lost access to medical care as a result. But these attacks, of course, are just the tip of the iceberg. And I'm really looking forward to the keynote speech this afternoon from the head of the Syrian American Medical Society. We will hear him bear witness to the targeted attacks that are taking place again and again on medical facilities in Syria and the incredibly brave medics that continue their work at enormous cost. The attacks on these MSF facilities and the ones that we support not only represent the tip of the iceberg on attacks on medical facilities, but they represent the tip of the iceberg in terms of attacks on civilian infrastructure. Marketplaces, schools, refugee camps. There is no restraint. This complete lack of restraint makes it very difficult for organizations like mine to work directly in many of today's conflicts. So we're having to reinvent ourselves. I don't know how many of you were here three years ago and you heard Jennifer Leaning from Harvard University exhort us to rethink the way that we work, that we work in many of today's <coughs> conflicts. And we're having to do that, particularly in Syria. It's not without its challenges, though. So we also rely on people being able to reach us. We work on the periphery of conflicts, and we wait for them to come to us. But that also is becoming increasingly difficult. From the shores of the UK to the borders of Turkey and Jordan with Syria, borders are closed, and millions of Syrians are trapped. We see boats being pushed away from the shores of Malaysia and Thailand. And just recently, an announcement that the oldest refugee camp in the world, Dadaab, is scheduled for closure, home to 250,000 Somalis. What voice can Europe raise in protest? A couple of weeks ago, I stood in front of a group of 40 tech entrepreneurs who were all very excited about the innovation, the way that technology is being applied to help refugees in Europe and elsewhere. But the single thing I told them that they could do that had the most impact would be to raise their voice. The apps are great, but we need them to speak out. They are a constituency that the government here in the UK, that other European governments and around the world, they're a constituency that government cares about. MSF is managing to work in one way or another and bring medical care to many of the places that I've just been talking about. But to do so, we rely on two legal frameworks, that of international humanitarian law and the Refugee Convention. These legal frameworks are the cornerstone of humanitarian action, but they are under attack. We are speaking out about that, but we need you to raise your voice as well. We cannot do this alone. In this room today, there are constituencies that governments also care about. So please join us and speak up and speak out. Starting with today, and we look forward to your lively participation in the debates to come. Enjoy it.